Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dahmer, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News new Service, jbiztechvalley.com, and now columnist for The Jewish Press. Yep, I'm writing a column called Albany Beat, and I'm trying to connect how Jewish community and the go- connects with the government, and you know, it's a very rewarding uh, challenge that I've uh, been given. So I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to continuing on for a long time. But with here now, we have right. a guest with us. Uh, you might recognize the last name, Aharon Simon, <laughs> who is Rabbi Simon's son, and yes. you're a rabbinic student in Crown Heights, yes. and you're also doing some teaching uh, for special ed students as well. Sure. Yes. So, I wanted to talk, yeah. Mark, he had a very special experience um, about traveling over Passover holiday to the far flungs, the Far East. They actually, you should know the Rebbe, when someone said the Far East, which is, of course, the normal to me, he says, I don't like far. He says, the place that's not so near. I mean, far, like you're far out, you're out of it, so to speak. That's what it connotates. And the Rebbe doesn't like that kind of idea. In any case, he did go. But um, what, before you do, why are rabbinical students traveling around the world? What's the purpose and why are they being sent away from home on uh, Passover when, you know, traditionally everybody is... It's a family uh, holiday. Yeah, a yeah. family holiday. Everybody is home for the holidays. And here, yeah. you know, I didn't have my son home for the holidays, and he went all the way to Korea. So why are they being sent away from home for Passover? So there's a lot of Jewish communities throughout the world, hundreds and hundreds, that um, either they are too small to have a rabbi, a full-time rabbi, or the rabbi that is in that community, there is a rabbi in that community, but he, there's too many people at that time of year, too many tourists, and he needs help. So we in Lubavitch, Chabad, um, people a- aged around between 18 to 20, usually between 18 to 22, 23, um, we get sent out by the Chabad, Mar- it's called Marcus, it's an organization that sends people like us out to different communities around the world. And how old are you? I am 22. 22. Yeah. You're right in, on the high side of that. Okay, yes. Good. So we get sent to all over the world, like literally every continent, South America, North America, everywhere, okay. Europe, So Asia. which, where have you been? So I, in the past when I was 18, maybe I was 19, I got sent to Ukraine. Right now it's actually in that area, in the very um, easternmost part of Ukraine, where there's the a lot of turmoil now. Yeah, I actually flew into Donetsk, into Lugansk, which is where all the fighting is now. So there I made, there I was with me and a friend, just us. We brought some kosher food, because obviously there's no kosher food there. And we, we um, there was a nice community, actually, maybe like 100 Jews, and very well-meaning. They talked about a lot about Israel, they knew Jewish songs, but they didn't have anyone to... Um, conduct services. They didn't. Re- they were very ignorant when it came to actual Jewish practices mm-hmm. because they didn't have anyone leading them. So we went there and we had a beautiful, beautiful seder. Um, actually, we we assumed there's we assumed that there would be two seders because usually I'm where I'm from and everyone there's always two seders. So we assumed that would, there would be two community seders. It was my first year. So at the end of the first seder. Um, there was a lot of very nice teenage kids over there that we were hanging out with and they were like, so what time do we come back tomorrow? And they said, there's no Seder tomorrow. So we were like, what? We assumed the whole time we were coming for two Seders and there was only one. So we actually invited them all, even though we weren't prepared for it. We had set up for, our, we had enough food for ourselves. Right. But it was the first night, so we knew we invited them all for the second night and uh-huh. we said, come by, you'll spend Seder. So actually we had like t- between 10, 10 and 15 teenagers come over to our hotel room and you made a second seat there. That was great. Yeah. So, and were, and do you was, stay in touch with them through Facebook and links so social media? Email a few of them through email. And yeah. do they are they continuing with the seders and with the two seders? And so I'm not sure now. I know a lot of shluchim in that area. There's some shluchim some messengers. some rabbis in the area have left because there's so much turmoil. I'm not exactly sure what happened, what's going on with that community. I know even Jewish people in that in those areas are moving westward, uh-huh. to more western parts of Ukraine. All right, but I but you do have some sort of. It's not like you just leave and then there. Yeah. You forget about them. I mean, well, and then things. people, new boys, come every single year to keep it up. So because they might need to know certain customs or why do we do this or how do we do this that you could, you know, let them know about. Yes. 
send them links to other well, just add itself as debtors young yeah. teenagers which you say really don't know about Judaism are interested enough not only to say okay okay one Seder but just hey you know you're here let's utilize the resource right. of young rabbinical students that we have and let's learn as much as we can in the short period of time that you yeah. were there. Did you stay through the intermediate days in Ukraine? Or? So no, Ukraine we left right away. I was still <laughs> young, I was 19 and uh -huh. I, didn't, I didn't have the gumption to travel well, you're only 22 now, so it's only yeah, but now years I can, <laughs> Now you're not young? <laughs> okay. no, I, can, I can hold my own. I can okay. go around myself. So, you, so where were you this past Pesach? So two years ago I went okay. to Lithuania, yeah. which is very similar to what, in Ukraine. I went to a place called Kovna. It was famous as a Kovna ghetto. Hundreds of thousands of Jews used to live there now, and then it's non-existent, really. No Jewish community. Very small. It was... It's smaller than Ukraine, I'd say. No, actually, they're around the same size. 100 people okay. the first night, and there was a second Seder the second night. Yeah. 30, 30 people. This past year, I was sent to South Korea, Seoul. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of Jews are in South Korea? So, it's very... I've never seen a commun Jewish community like it before. I'm not sure how many there are in the world like that. It's, there's not really any people... There's maybe five or ten people that live there and are part of the Jewish community for ten more than five years. Most people that are in the Jewish community there are... Transient? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're either there as transfer students for a year. <clears throat> you have a lot of tech businessmen that come for like one or two years. Mm -hmm. They get sent from Israeli small-time businesses, small-time tech companies to learn or to bring their products over there. So you have maybe 30, 40 Israelis there. In so the tech you, industry or other small. Did you businesses. put the Jewish soul in Seoul? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there was there was a there was a full time Chabad rabbi rabbi where I went this time. So I wasn't on my own in the past. I was always on my own this time, and we were with a Chabad rabbi. But and do you have your uh, smicha, your rabbi in it? Yeah, yes, you do. You yeah. your rabbi Aaron yes. Simon. Yeah. Okay. That I got in Israel last year. Okay, Mazel yeah. So. You, so when you say we had a Chabad rabbi, you're the Chabad rabbi. Then, yeah. you know. <laughs> a permanent. So, who, a permanent so what was your function there in South Korea if there's already a rabbi? Yeah, so he, he has a big job for him. So, I mean, he is the only rabbi full-time. I mean, there's some chaplains in the, army, in the American army bases, but he's the only full-time community rabbi in the entire South Korea. So there's Jews, you know, two hours up, three hours south, and he's kind of covering all bases. Mm. He also, since he's the only rabbi, he also runs a, a store, a kosher store. And when we came for Pesach, a lot, a few days, what we helped out was was with his Pesach store. He had to set it up. He had an right. online thing. We're shipping it out to all the different Jews in the area. Mm. And people were coming in throughout the day. Jews were coming in throughout the day to either buy stuff or to stop into the to the Chabad house. So is it Shmur Matzah or is it hand? Made matzah? Is it both? Is, is it machine made or? He would. He would. He was selling and giving out both. I mean, both. yeah. Giving out or selling? He was giving out shmara matzah, but right. selling all Pesach food, whatever one any, anyone wanted. If you wanted egg matzah, whatever. So it was. how now all the shmara matzah I. Thinking is made in Brooklyn, the center of the universe. Uh, Not necessarily. <laughs> actually. Do they? Because they ship from Borough Park and Crown Heights. They ship to all over the world. They do, but there's so other options. There are. You have. Kfar, I mean, we got. I know my father gets, and we had a lot of the same matzah in South Korea. It's actually from Ukraine. I'm not exactly sure why. Well, the Ukraine was the breadbasket of, of Russia always. I mean, you can't say wheat. that about matzah, the breadbasket. Yeah, well, it's the wheat. The <laughs> wheat is wheat. You make uh, matzah, you make bread out of wheat. And that's why, I mean, they had a resource there. So okay. they put people to work and make some so, decent money. But from the Ukraine to South Korea? Yes. Okay. Some of it. And some of it's from Israel, some of it's from Brooklyn. I mean, he had a whole array of different types of matzos, so it wasn't... And you obviously chose the Brooklyn ones. Mm, yeah. Because that's I what like you're it most better, comfortable. better than the Ukrainian matzo for me, but... Okay. Yeah. So who were the Jewish people that you served? So, like I said, there were some Israelis, a lot of transfer students. Then there's some people that lived there throughout the year, um, different types of businesses, in and out. But I'd say 50% of the community is actually connected to the army base. There's a young son. It's the I'm pretty sure it's the biggest army base in that South Korea. Okay. In, it might be in that whole South Korea area, in the whole region of the world, I'm not sure. But 
it, for sure in South Korea it's the biggest and it was right down the road from where the Chabad house was. So we didn't really see the soldiers so much because the soldiers kind of stay on base and they do have an army chaplain and it's a rabbi actually, not always it's a rabbi, but over there it's a rabbi. So he had a very successful Seder over there, over 50 people a night. But some, there's a lot of Jewish like, um, contractors, people that work in intelligence, you mm -hmm. know, plain clothes army personnel that are part of the community. But even them, they're there for maximum five years, maybe 10 years. Most people are in and out one year, two years. I actually, the people I stayed at was um, a family. The man was a intelligence, was in, in the intelligence. Uh, U.S. intelligence? U.S. intelligence, yeah. Which is sometimes, some people say an oxymoron, U.S. intelligence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's but, people like that, and it's yeah. very wide. So the Seder, even though in John, he, the, rab, the Chabad rabbi who's permanently there is, yeah. is Israeli, the Seder was actually done in English because, I mean, there was a crazy amount of nationalities by the same. It was like some close to 10. Canada, America, f a lot of French, Israelis, South Korean, obviously. And English was the m connecting language English for everyone? Was, yeah, yes. Even wow. though the Chabad rabbi was actually Israeli. I mean, his English was pretty good. But, wow. Yeah. And when he didn't have the grammar just right, you stepped in and... Yeah. Okay. Well, I did, we did, you know, we had a <laughs> little jobs that we did. I did the end of one of the satyrs I led. And, oh, good. Do they feel yeah. any danger there? You know, in South Korea, of course, there's a Korean War in the, you know, late 40s and early 50s. And, you know, Correct. sometimes there's always this tension, North Korea throwing off a missile. You know, you get a headline like that. Um, there was any tension? I didn't. People well, just live. First of all, the Korean conflict, because there was never yeah. a war, right. per yeah. se. <laughs> And no, All I right. mean, that's well, you're right. You're the news reporter. Look, you got to be correct in your uh, late. Just don't point. want letters and, you know, yeah. just to write any of our viewers to write in, you know. OK, <laughs> so um, that it feels extremely safe. I was actually when I went there, I was a little disappointed at being in Ukraine and Lithuania and different yeah. countries. That, you know, it's nice to see like the third world kind of aspect to it. But Seoul was like you walk off the plane. It's like a regular Amer if everything mm -hmm. would have been in English, you wouldn't have known you were in America. Wow. It's so advanced and clean and really nice. The people are nice and it's not, yeah, it's just like a regular, I was like a disappointed. There was nothing really to see. It's just like, a, <laughs> you know, skyscrapers and nice buildings, nice Neon hotels. lights and all that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really very Americanized. Okay. But um, safe-wise, it feels really safe. I mean, I went to the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. Which is the 38th parallel? Yeah, 39th, 39th parallel. 39th parallel. Oh, that was close. So, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not, you don't feel danger at all. There's mm -hmm. no, yeah. I mean, you see it a little bit more. You see shelters, like you right. see in Israel a little bit more. Not as much as Israel, obviously, but you, there are, like, there's signs for shelters, and, but it feels extremely safe over there. You know, you had an interesting experience, tell us uh, our viewers about going to Korea. There was a stopover, so tell us yes. about that. On the way to um, South Korea, we had a stopover in Dubai for um, eight, nine hours. I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly. We were out of the airport for like seven hours. And we were actually out at nighttime. But I didn't really, we didn't really know what to expect. We were just, we decided, you know, you know, we were dressed with the beards and the... We very I guess, that's what I was saying, an interesting scenario here. You have Orthodox Jews that obviously that's what you yeah. look like. And you're going to... Uh, an Arab Muslim country, yeah. walking around. Is it an Arab Muslim yes, country? Yes, it, it is. I mean, I've been in Israel for two years of, and many sum, and a few summers, and I didn't. You didn't. You don't see the the type of people that you see in Dubai. I mean, it wasn't scary though. I mean, you see, you know, they're Muslims dressed in all the white, white uh, mm -hmm. robes and mm -hmm. with the um, kafiyas and everything. Mm -hmm. But we actually, so we didn't really know what to expect. So we actually got pulled over by the border patrol. They didn't, everyone else, they have like these very advanced um, electronic border control. You, you don't mm -hmm. even meet, you're not meant to see people. You're meant to just go through. There's like these electronic mm -hmm. gates, you put your passport or whatever. So they didn't let us in. So everyone was going in and we got stopped and whatever, we, they pulled us aside. And in the end, it turned out they were just, they were, they were, scared for our own safety. They said, mm -hmm. you know, cover your, cover your yarmulke, make sure no one sees your tzitzis, just, you know, play it safe. That's the only reason why they didn't, at, at least that's what it seemed like. And then me. they let you through. Yeah, they let us through, no problem. Yeah. They were really nice. They were actually very nice, very polite. Were these American or Dubai? No, Dubai people. Dubai, They're very yeah. strong accent. They don't speak uh, very, it's very good English. But they do speak English there. Yeah. That's amazing. So then we went out of the airport and 
we didn't, so, again, we so didn't. I'm, I'm trying to understand this a little. Yeah. You were on a plane going from Brooklyn yeah. or New York, New York JFK. Airport, JFK, yeah. and you were going to South Korea, but they had a stopover in Dubai. Exactly. And what what air, what line airline? Emirates. It's actually United Dubai Arab is Emirates. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, you were on their airline yes. and you stopped in Dubai. Dubai. Exactly. And then you decide you knew you had a seven hour layover. Yeah. Yeah. We so, decided we were gonna go. So out then you airport. got off the plane. You got left yeah. the airport. Yeah. You got stopped by border patrol, and then they they told you for your own safety. Put on a hat. Or they right. told us to put on. And a hat. then you moved yeah. on yeah, from exactly. there. And then you went into this. What city did you go? Dubai. Okay. So, yeah. Dubai is the city in du United Arab exactly. Emirates. Okay. Exactly. Now, is it the capital? I think Abu Dhabi is. Abu Dhabi. I'm okay. Sure, yeah. So, you went to Dubai. Now, Dubai has some of the tallest buildings, yes. and they have some of the most extravagant lifestyles yeah. there. What did so you So, I, I was, again, I was only there for seven hours. We really well, had to choose what we wanted. Maybe five hours, because by the time you got into the city, by the time you yeah. came back, I mean, the, it might have been. The stopover was like 10, I think. Close to ten, so we were out, out of okay. the airport for around seven. Okay. Um, so we, I mean, they have the biggest mall. I think the airport connected into the biggest. No, we took a subway into the biggest mall in the, of the, the in the world. Okay. And then from the biggest mall in the world, we went outside, and over there is. Um, it's like it really reminded me of Disney World, honestly, because they have all these like fake, like. Um, Fountains yeah. and waterfalls and like these bridges covering the water with like big palm trees and stuff like that It actually feels like Disneyland and in the backdrop is this beautiful mall a really gorgeous mall and the Burj Khalifa Which is the tallest yeah. building in the world 150 something. What's the name of it? Burj Khalifa British? Burj, B-U-R-J oh. yeah, Burj Khalifa So then we did that we walked around that was just beautiful in itself just the mall in that area And then we decided we'll go up to the Burj Khalifa so there's observation deck at 124, at floor 124. How many floors is it? Uh, 155, I think. And you only got to 124? Yeah, so on 155 is a restaurant, and you have to be dressed properly and bow ties and stuff like that. So we can do it. Also, we were going, we, were, we had to be back in the airport at 3 in the morning. So we were actually during, in the middle of the night, we were out there. And there were still hundreds of people outside. It wasn't, sure. it wasn't sleeping. Another city that doesn't that never sleeps, not yeah. just New York City. Yeah. But then as I was leaving, I don't remember who told me, maybe the taxi driver. The taxi driver was very excited because he's like, where are you guys from? So we're like, yes, yes. Sir. He said, we're some, me and my, uh, the, my partner I was going with, we're, we're both dark complexion. So he said, some are, you're Arabic, someone. So we're like, we're from Israel, we're Israeli, we're Jewish. He's, he was so happy because he had never met a, met a Jew before. <laughs> I mean, Dubai, there's not many Jews over there. But he, I think it was him who told me that only 11% of the population of Dubai are actually from Dubai. Uh -huh. The other 89% are, are tran yeah, tran yeah. coming to work or from different parts of the world. Wow. And you never felt scared or, um, no, no, no. you know, I mean, you're, like I say, a Jewish person in an Arab country. Yeah, no, no, now, no, now no you, one made any comments. Now you me. took, what, selfies or you took pictures yes. that you sent back via... <laughs> Facebook or something? No, or not Facebook. But just yes, email my back? family, WhatsApp and all that stuff. Yeah, so what were some of the pictures that you oh, took? Yeah, picture. I mean, I've never seen people dressed like that before, so you have some pictures of me and my uh, friend with some, some guys lined up with the, all the, uh -huh, the garb. Robes, yeah. yeah. And did you, um, and you took pictures from the 124th floor? Or? Yeah. I mean, it was a little bit d disappointing in a way just because it's like, I mean, you could kind of see the same thing out of an airplane. When you come in, you see the same thing. So, I mean, you see, you're so high up that it's like a bird's eye view. You don't really get to see. Okay. I mean, you see the lights and you see. That's it, but you can't make yeah, out what those you know, lights we are. You were there right? during the night, so again. Uh -huh. I, I've taken the kids, the groups, to Empire State Building. Uh -huh. And, you, you know, you wait and then you pay money. And then after two minutes, I'm bored. <laughs> you know, you yeah. look outside and, all right, I saw it. And, <laughs> and then, well, we waited so long and we just, you know, a highlight. Well, I hate, to, the same thing. I hate to tell you this. You're comparing Dubai to Disney World. When you go, if you ever go to Las Vegas, which maybe you not, no, maybe, you nev maybe you never will, but yeah. if you do, it'll look like that in thing. Las Vegas. But, yeah. you, you know, you have all these extravagant hotels, the front, uh, fronts of the hotels and stuff. So, and they have, you know, the uh, New York City streetscape and they have another 
like this and when they have other uh, countries that are uh, represented by the diff different hotels you have Italy and all the others so I just thought I'd yeah. mention that not so that not to yeah. encourage you to go to Las Vegas but uh, I, I didn't go to gamble no I didn't go to gamble <laughs> You can go no, to Disney World. I just, <laughs> I've been there. Been there too. So, so, yeah, so are you, uh, w where do you think you're going to go next? Or when do you know about when you're going to go next? How does this work? That they so <clears throat> there's in general, there's a few times of year <clears throat> that you get sent. You can go for Pesach is a time when communities around the world need help. Um, and during Rosh Hashanah, the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, it, to a lesser extent, the less people go then because people are, it's a longer period of time. You have to go from you know, before Rosh Hashanah mm -hmm. till after, and then it's close cut also <clears throat> between Sukkot and yeah. to fly. It's, so people go, the friend I went with to, um, to um, South Korea had the previous year had Give been to India. Give him a shout out. What's his name? My Shibigan. Okay. He'd been to uh, India uh -huh. for the high holidays okay. the, year, the previous year. But in general, it's Pesach, Passover, and the summer. So I'm, I signed up to go from July 1st. To where? To J the later end of July, three weeks. But they don't tell you till maybe a week before really? where you're going. Yeah. Well, where do you want to go? Did they give you some, did no. they ask you for choices? No. Or, you know? no op they just tell you like a week before, this is where you are. Call us for the tickets. We'll send you out. You're so it doesn't cost you a dime? No. Oh, it's doing the service to the company. I know that, yeah. but that doesn't yeah, no, mean it doesn't yeah, no, cost but anything. Yeah. They send you, they pay for the flights, and depending where you go, if like I went to the community, South Korea, there's already a rabbi there, so the rabbi took care of all the rest. Mm -hmm. He had to deal with you know taxis and food and all that stuff. Hospital. If you go to a random community like I went to in Ukraine, you kind of have to take care of it yourself and then send in a a bill kind receipts, of, a receipts yeah. to, to, to the organization. You know, and uh, what's the organization's name? Again? Mercos. Mercos. M E R K A O S. O S. Yeah. It's Mercos Linyane Pinuch is the official name. It's the Lubavitch Education Arm. So they send students all over. Because they, they, they do in the United States too. It's not only, you know, uh -huh. these exotic places, but I mean, there are cities. Throughout the United States, same situation really. You know, there's 10, 50 Jews, and they can't afford a rabbi, and mm -hmm. kids don't get an education, and people don't have any rabbinic services. So they uh, really go around the United States also. So, w w some of the people that you know, won't say necessarily friends, but acquaintances, whatever, where have they gone within the United States? Within the United States? Not many, I know, go within the United States. I mean, Florida, well, my son, I know. My previous son, uh, I have previous son. Yet, uh, <laughs> but previous years, my son has gone uh, into Nebraska. I mean, now again, the major city, just like our own saying, the major city is taken care of. But there's always suburbs and... Yeah, you can yeah. See that. I, if we look at the capital district. Well, I, I was mean, just wondering, in this conversation, yeah. if he knew of certain... Sure, I know, I have a friend that went somewhere, I don't really know exactly where a city outside of Chicago. But in general, they send people that are younger to the... the within the United within States. Within the United yeah, States, right. yeah. yeah younger. 18 years old. I so see. I was lucky the first year, I was, I mean, I feel I was lucky the first year to get sent overseas. Right. I was only 18, 19 years old. But well, a lot of guys that age... age thank you. A lot of guys that age um, do get sent into the United States. But usually after that time frame, you get sent all over the world. I have friends, I mean, everywhere. Peru, mm -hmm. India, China... I mean, literally everywhere. Uh, Congo, uh, an island off of Brazil. This same one, Moshe Begun, who went to India, he went to an island off of Brazil for a few years okay. to do Pesach. I mean, everywhere, all over Ukraine, especially Eastern Europe, is very, very, a lot of people get sent there. And, and you're not chaperoned with anyone. You're just no, on you your own. You have to do it on your own. <laughs> yeah. And what. Um, are there any, is there any, I don't know, I, just because of where m my headset is, you know, I'm not, I don't mean this disrespectfully, yeah. but is there any politics involved as to, you know, can you get the inside track on Listen, who sends Mark, and this? Mark, you're too much in Albany over here. I know here. that, yeah, I know that. I, I, I prefaced it with that, yeah. I'm just <laughs> asking, you know. Obviously there are, meaning they, the organization, Marcus, this organization, you know, they keep it very simple. You know, they're sending out hundreds of people and talk. The five, I think there was 500 locations, over 500 locations for, for Pesach, for Passover. So, I mean, if you ask people where they want to go and yeah. this one doesn't like it, and this, so they keep it very simple and they just 
tell you some days, a few days before you're meant to go. Like, okay, here you are. Here's your tickets. Wow. But, no complaining over it. But here. with that said, obviously there is there are people that are in charge, and if you know that person, you kind of can try to sneak in a good. Continue your travels, good. though, our own. There, you had one more stopover, yeah. and then the last few minutes, let's talk about where's your other stopover. After I went to South Korea, I spent a few days there after the Seder, and then for the second days of Passover, I went to Thailand, and we spent. Um, we spent three days in Bangkok by, by the rabbi over there. They have a very nice, very nice building and a lot of. It's catering to Israeli tourists. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of Israeli tourists that come. What, con they, what country? Thailand. Why do they Thailand. go there? Yes. Oh, why are they there? Oh, Thailand. Mm -hmm. Oh, this. Go ahead. Tell them go why people, why the Jews go. Um, You've been they, to America. No, I know <laughs> why. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, All right, go they ahead. go because I mean, it's untouched, like. Beauty, mm -hmm. really. It's yeah. very cheap. I With mean, the, the people, the Israelis mean, that go there are not inexpensive. It's inexpensive. It's it's not, it's not, it's not um, fifty year old people that are going there. It's people, kids coming right out of the army. They're twenty two years old. They don't have that much money. They spend. Right. They you know some of them go for a year. They can't mm -hmm. spend, you know, ten thousand dollars in one space. Right. So they go to Thailand. It's very cheap and it's really beautiful. And what city did you go to in Thailand? So I went for three days to Bangkok. That was just for the holidays, the second part of the holidays. And um, then I flew to a resort city vacation kind of called Phuket. Oh. Phuket, yeah. Okay, I mispronounce that one all the time. I won't yeah. go there. Uh, <laughs> and so yes. <laughs> over there, I mean, Bangkok is a big city, so the Israelis go there and they do spend time there, but they usually channel off into the smaller areas near the beaches and stuff like that. So Phuket is on a beach. They go to another place called Koh Samui. So where I was, I didn't go for any rabbinical Religious reason. reason. Religious no, you reason. went I for vacation. For so I had a, me and my friend Moishi flew from South Korea to Thailand. We had a friend that had been there for Pesach mm -hmm. in Phuket. So we met up with him. And we spent time in the Chabad house over there. It's also a very nice Chabad house. People Great place to have in a and Chabad out. house. Yes. If you have to have one, that's yeah. not a bad place. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let me know if you need a chaperone. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be happy to sign I'll take you along dotted you line. <laughs> and it is that beautiful, the nature. And yeah. I mean, it really is beautiful. I, I took a boat ride to small little islands. Um, and it's... I've never seen anything like it before. No. I mean, I'm seeing pictures of Hawaii. It looks kind of similar, tropical, yeah. like that. But it's, I've never been to anywhere more beautiful in my life. Mm. It no, nice. it's true. Outside of Ellesmere Avenue, Ellesmere. <laughs> yeah. Delmar, Delmar, you haven't been to any place more beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> He's a world traveler. I'm telling uh, you, you're really, it's really wonderful to yeah. see how all of this has, you know, this is how you're growing up, and this is the way that, you know, you... Uh, you get to, this is the time of your life that you get to see the world. I mean, you know, it's yeah. not going to happen once you get married and have kids. So yeah, that's true. there yeah, was Jewish is, life in Thailand, you know? I yeah. Mean, I mean, if there's so many I mean, thousands of people there. Well, yeah, and he like said I said, it's very transient, though. Mm -hmm. It's not no community. I mean, in Bangkok, there's, there's one Chabad house in Bangkok that's known for to have a community. All the other ones kind of cater to the Israeli tourists. It's in and out, really. Do they have a, a dynamic Chabad rabbi that, that sort of reaches out and then brings people in, like he attracts them like a magnet? He attracts or? them, but I mean, he's been there for 20 years. By now, it's like, it's already known. The Israelis come off the plane, they stop in the Chabad house to get a coffee. To, they also, they, they, their mentality is kind of like a backpacker style. So they just go sure. without any agenda or schedule. Right. So they just come. And the Chabad house is a place where, I mean, it's set up in a way where they can hang out there. There's couches and sofas and coffee mm -hmm. and water and food and... So that's where they automatically, it's almost like so a magnet. So why did you they leave? get <laughs> attracted there. He think Delmar is better. Why did you stay? Brooklyn, Brooklyn. He wants to go back to yeah. Brooklyn. Well, if it was so beautiful, you know. I should have. You should have just stayed and written, you know, I'm not coming home. <laughs> leave, my God. I want him back. You want him back. Well, maybe you'll go to Thailand to visit him. A good, good excuse. <laughs> Me and you, Margot. That's yeah, it. We'll travel together. So, right, so any final words or anything that you want to tell us about that we didn't know enough to ask you that you want to just sort of expound upon and say, I mean, oh, so that five minutes after the show's over, you don't go, oh, I wish I said that. <laughs> I think we covered up. Covered it? He covered it. It was a good experience. It was a very good experience. Well, I always enjoy doing it because they always say, 
giving is the best way of getting. That's right. When you go out and see, I mean, it's always also nice to see different parts of the world, but helping people out and spending time with people from way different, very different ba backgrounds, and it's just nice to really give to other, to give to others that need the uh, need the inspiration. Well, keep up the good work and much success to you. You thank know, you. Aaron, thank you for coming and sh sharing your interesting uh, travels with our viewers, that there are Jewish communities. People don't think there's Jewish people beyond Brooklyn altogether. And um, there are Jewish people all over the world. And, you know, and it's important that people like yourself cater to their Jewish needs. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.